In this video, we'll go through component selection and sizing for switching converters, and in particular, looking at buck converters. As a brief overview, this is what we'll be looking at. We'll briefly be going over buck converter theory and the basic topology. I've covered this more in detail in other videos, and I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Then we'll look at requirement specification. So for a specific application, we might have a certain input voltage range, a required output voltage, and a required load current. These specifications will then lead us to choosing an IC. This has to be suitable for the requirements. It may contain internal or external switches, diodes, and other circuitry. And we'll look at some distributors to see what options there are. Once we have our IC and our requirements in place, we finally need to look at component selection. That means sizing the inductor appropriately, choosing input and output capacitors, possibly a diode if the IC requires it, as well as selecting feedback circuitry. We won't be covering the enable circuitry, for example, when the switching regulator should turn on. There's typically features such as under voltage lockout and over voltage lockout, but we won't be looking at that in this video because that's fairly self-explanatory. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, you can go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's lab to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial, as well as 25% off your first license purchase. To get you started with Altium Designer, I have a fairly complete walkthrough just under three hours on my channel called STM32 PCB Design with Altium Designer. That's video number 41. If you haven't seen the video already, I highly recommend watching the Switching Regulator PCB Design video, which is number 60 on my channel. And this guides you through also the PCB design and layout aspects of switching regulators, as well as giving you more of the theory. Here's the typical topology for a buck converter. Now there's different flavors of buck converter, for example, synchronous, non-synchronous, and so on. This is a non-synchronous. So we have only one switching element, which is typically a transistor or field effect transistor. Buck converter is also known as step-down converter. That means we have an input voltage and that is being fed through circuitry that then reduces that input voltage to give us an output voltage that is lower than the input. Typical components are an input capacitor, an output capacitor, which is across the load, our switch, which is our transistor, a flyback diode or a rectified diode, a magnetic element, typically an inductor, and then we have this feedback circuitry over here. We require a DC voltage source of higher potential than the output voltage. The input and output capacitors act as energy reservoirs, storage. Depending on the on time of the switch or the duty cycle of the switch and the overall efficiency of the rectifier, we have the buck converter equation at the bottom, which means the output voltage is approximately equal to the duty cycle times the efficiency times the input voltage. So if the switch is on for longer periods of a time, we'll have a higher output voltage on average. If it's off for most of the time, of course, this output voltage then will be lower. The inductor and capacitor together form a filtering circuit, so to speak, filtering all of these high frequency switching harmonics out and smoothing the output voltage. This diode, typically a Schottky diode, is there when the switch is open to give the energy some place to flow. So we have a current path in this inner loop once the switch is open. And the feedback network essentially samples the output voltage, steps it down, and feeds it back to this switching controller, which then adjusts the duty cycle to make sure we get a stable output voltage at our set point. Now that we've briefly gone over the elements of a switching converter, we need to define certain parameters which are application specific. First of all, we might have an, a necessary input voltage range. And in an example, I'd like to show you this input voltage range for this application specifically is 12 volts minimum to a maximum of just under 17 volts. We also need to know a nominal output voltage, and that in my case is 3.3 volts that I would like. We also need to know what our maximum output or load current will be. So in my application, I require something around 500 milliamps. So the input voltage range, normal output voltage and output current or our load current give us as a bare minimum the specifications for us to be able to choose a buck converter integrated circuit. Once you have the requirements in place, you can go to your preferred distributor's website. Mine happens to be Mouser. And then I went to the power management ICs, voltage regulators and switching regulator section. I will click in stock. I prefer S&D components, package case I'm not really worried about, but I would like to choose a buck converter and here I can choose my output voltage range, so 3.3 volts should be included, and I can use that to exclude that. Output current, I want something around 500 milliamps, so I'll just select 500 milliamps and larger than. I just want one output, 
and switching frequency, which will be important later, I want to be fairly high. So at least 500 kilohertz, because a larger switching frequency reduces the size of our external components, reduces the size of inductors and capacitors we need. Once you're done, don't forget to select the output voltage, click apply filters, and then we can just sort by price, for example, and you can see we have quite a bit of variety of regulators. So now it's important to go through the parts or maybe refine the filters a bit more, and then check out the parts which are suitable price-wise, have enough availability, and also have hopefully easy to solder packages, packages that are small enough for your application. For example, this might be a suitable candidate here. Input voltage range is 4.2 to 18 volts, output 0.8 to 7. Two amps continuous output current, which seems to be rather overkill for our application. I ended up choosing this rather different buck converter, which is suitable for the application, 800 milliamps of output current, fairly high efficiency. We don't need an external shot key diode, which is really useful. So remember to check the data sheet for that. And it's a step down converter in a very simple package with not a lot of required external circuitry. So now that we have our requirements in place, as well as we've chosen a suitable, at least initially suitable IC, we need to go through some calculations. The first is that of the maximum switching current. We know our load current approximately, approximately half an amp, but it actually happens that the switches, diodes, and inductor currents will typically be larger, or peak currents will be larger in a switching regulator. And we need to make sure when we've picked a device and inductors and so on, that these can sustain that current. The switch is typically in the IC and it is with our chosen integrated circuit as well. The diode can be in the IC and it happens to be in this case. The first part of this calculation is calculating the duty cycle. Remember, the duty cycle relates effectively the input voltage to the output voltage. The duty cycle is approximately the output voltage divided by the input voltage, the maximum input voltage, and divided by the efficiency. So in our case, that would be 3.3 volts divided by 16.8 volts divided by an efficiency of somewhere between 80 to 90%. It isn't entirely critical, something in the ballpark, and you can usually get this from the data sheet. So we get a duty cycle of about 0.25. Once we have that, we need to calculate the inductor ripple current. And because we don't know our inductor size, and this inductor size appears in the ripple current equation, we should use an average inductor value taken from the data sheet. And here we are on the data sheet, going to the inductor selection section, and they'll give us a value between 4.7 microhenries to 22 microhenries for this specific IC. So we'll take an average of that, add them together, divide by two, and use that in our calculation. So we take an average inductor value, L average. We've had our switching frequency, remember from the data sheet, was 800 kilohertz, so 800 times 10 to the three. We need our maximum input voltage, which is 16.8 volts in this case, and output voltage is just 3.3 times by our duty cycle, which is 0.25. And that happens to give me an inductor ripple current of 325 milliamps. Okay, so that's great and fairly easy to calculate. Next, we need to check if the IC we chose can deliver our maximum output current also given this ripple current. For this, we need to go to the data sheet again, and this will be in any switching regulator or buck converter data sheet, and this is the high side current limit or I lim. And this is given as two amps. So two amps minus half the inductor ripple current, this value, which turns out to be 1.84 amps in our case, needs to be greater than whatever load current you have. And our load current in this example was half an amp, so we are well above that, and that's okay, that's great. So the IC can deliver the maximum output current with ease. The last part of this calculation is then to calculate the actual maximum switching current, and this is simply the maximum output or load current plus half the inductor ripple current. So it's 500 milliamps plus half of 325, which is approximately 660 milliamps. So this is the critical value, which is essentially the peak switch, diode, and inductor current that our circuitry needs to be able to sustain. So it's not 500 milliamps, it's higher, it's 660 milliamps. I'm afraid component selection for switching regulators is quite calculation heavy, but this should hopefully be a guide that you can use for all of your circuits that require buck converters. Next, we have come up with this inductor selection, so calculating the value of our magnetic element, and the typical formula for this, which is basically data sheet independent, and this gives us a lower bound or minimum value of our inductor size. It's our output voltage times the input-output differential, so input voltage maximum minus the output voltage divided by the inductor ripple current, divided by the switching frequency, and divided by the maximum input voltage again. So remember previously we assumed an average value of inductor to calculate our ripple current. However, we don't know what L is yet. We don't know our inductor value. So the question is, how do we choose the inductor ripple current if L isn't known yet? So how do we calculate delta IL? 
Typically, the rule of thumb is to estimate a ripple current to be approximately 20 to 40% of the maximum output current, and that gets you in the right ballpark. So plugging those values in, I typically go for 0.3 times the maximum output current, so 30%, and then plugging those values in, simply taking this formula, plugging in from our design, the values gives me a lower bound of 22 microhenries. So that was pretty simple. And that's a standard value as well, which is great. I also highly recommend using a graphing calculator and checking out some of these equations, plugging in some numbers and using some sliders to get a feel for what these different parameters affect. So I've set up a little simulation, so to speak, here. We have on the y-axis inductance in microhenries. On the x-axis is just the input voltage range. So our input voltage range, in this case, I've just set between 12 and 16.8 volts. If I set V out to 3.3, my inductor ripple current to be at 30% of the maximum, and my maximum output current to be 500 milliamps, I get an inductor range anywhere between 80 and about 90 microhenries. And this is for a switching frequency of 200 kilohertz. So if I increase that to 800 kilohertz, you can see this drastically reduces the size of the inductor I need. So that's why actually using ICs with high switching frequencies is usually a really good idea because it decreases your component sizes. If I play around with the output voltage, so a higher output voltage means I require a 1% tolerance resistors. Output voltage means I need a smaller inductor on average. If I change my approximation of the ripple current, a smaller ripple current requires a larger inductor. A larger ripple current means a smaller inductor. A larger load current means a smaller inductor, and a lower load current means a larger inductor. So quite cool to see directly what effects these values have. The actual inductor I then end up going with is this Sunlord 22 microhenry inductor. You have to watch out for tolerances as well to make sure you know they are within reasonable bounds. And of course the current rating, 2.5 amps, which is you know considerably higher than our requirements, but it's good to stay away from minimums. Also make sure that you get shielded inductors typically, and also make sure that the package size is suitable for your requirements and your PCB size and dimensions. After the magnetic element, we want to look at the diode, and this is often included in the IC and make sure to check your IC's limits. However, if you need to include an external diode, you need to choose a Schottky diode to minimize switching losses. Two important factors, one is the current rating, which needs to sustain the current when the main switch is off, and the, so the forward current has to be the maximum output current times one minus the duty cycle, because of course the switch is off. So in our case, that would be 375 milliamps. And depending on which Schottky diode you choose, so forward voltage will of course be different between diodes, the forward voltage times the maximum forward current is of course the power dissipation and our Schottky diode needs to be able to handle that. So something which can be quite a complex topic is the input output capacitor selection. And there's no straightforward way of calculating this. Data sheets will give you sometimes quite complex and long equations to do that, but you have to know the capacitor ESR's properties pretty well to be able to use them. Luckily, for input and output capacitors, the values are typically given in the datasheet. And this is an extract from the datasheet we just saw. We need, you know, a 22 microfarad ceramic capacitor is sufficient for most applications. And you typically can't go wrong with a larger value. You have to watch out for inrush currents and so on, of course. Advice is always to use low ESR or low equivalent series resistors capacitors. Make sure they're suitable dielectrics, so X5R, and have good voltage and temperature ratings so they don't get derated with applied bias. Similar thoughts for the output capacitor. So the minimum and equations are typically given in the data sheet. Again, we want low ESR capacitors and typically larger values to reduce the output voltage ripple. Again, check the dielectric and voltage rating. So from the data sheet, we might get an equation like this, which gives us output voltage ripple, given all of these parameters. And you can see we need to know oscillation frequencies, output capacitances, equivalent series resistances, and so on. But luckily the data sheet also says 10 microfarads ceramic is usually okay in most situations. I would always just increase that by amount. Lastly, and quite importantly, of course, we need to set the output voltage, and this is done via this feedback network, as you can see on the right here. Typically, it's only a set of resistors, so a resistor divider. Sometimes you will find compensation networks, so these capacitors, which change essentially the loop response or the control system response of this buck regulator. Typically, we take the voltage of the output, divide that down with two resistors, and feed that to the feedback node. The feedback node typically has a fixed internal voltage reference, and that's usually fixed by precision voltage reference, and that's the value of V feedback is given in the data sheet. For IC, it's 0.8 volts, and it's typically around 0.8 volts, but make sure to check the data sheet. 
Using simple potential divider theory and rearranging a bit, the output voltage is then the feedback voltage times one plus the ratio of feedback resistors top to bottom. Now you need to make sure to get a suitable order of magnitude of these feedback resistors. So not choosing, for example, just ohms, but rather kilo ohms is typical. So 10 to 100 kilo ohms in the range. And also make sure the tolerance is okay. Typically 1% resistors is, what, is what's required here. So I've chosen a 75 kilo ohm resistor for the top and 24 kilo ohm resistor for the bottom. I add one to that ratio and times by 0 0.8 and I get 3.3 volts as my output voltage, exactly what I want. We can do a similar plot for the output voltage depending on the tolerance of the feedback resistors. So remember the feedback voltage times one plus R1 over R2, that is of the feedback network, gives us our output voltage. So I've included a tolerance into this equation, which is this D term, I can play around with that. So with a typical 1% tolerance resistors, I might have a nominal output voltage of 3.3 volts, but this can go down to 3.25 volts in the worst case and 3.35 volts in the worst case with 1% tolerance resistors. Now, if I choose 5% tolerance resistors, you can see I have a nominal 3.3 volts, but this can drop down to 3.05 or go up to 3.55 in the worst case. So this is why it, it pays to use in Altium Designer. This is the actual implementation in a schematic, and you can see very familiar values around here. I have my input capacitor, which the datasheet recommended at 22 microfarads minimum. I've more than doubled that just to make sure. I have my enable signal. I have my 22 micro Henry inductor, and I've chosen a 47 microfarad output capacitor. 10 microfarads was given as a minimum, but I typically use larger capacitances. My feedback network, taking the output voltage, 3.3 volts, stepping that down to 0.8 volts to go into my feedback node. Sometimes you'll also see these bootstrap capacitors and these will be connected between a bootstrap pin and the switch node pin. And these are typically, you know, 100 nanofarad capacitors, but that's given in the data sheet. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and you can implement some of these tips in your designs. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel, leave a like if you like the video and a comment if you have any questions. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye.